Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, we are talking about our business Blue Ribbon Landscaping based out of Buford, Georgia and our six month of operating it. If you guys have a business that you guys are looking to sell in the landscaping space in the North Carolinas, the South Carolinas, the Georgia and Florida, feel free to reach out to either one of us, Noble or Forced or I to basically discuss how we could help with that deal. Uh, today, I'm going to be discussing the six month mark, a little over six month in our business that we end up acquiring at the top of the year. Uh, and we're going to be going over a bunch of things, our financials, our operations, our marketing, and then how we are acquiring other businesses. Um, I'm going to start off with going to the nitty gritty of the financials of the business and how much revenue that we're generating now between last year and then um, how much money are we keeping and then the growth of the percentage wise of the business. So I'll hand it over to Forrest since he's the head of operations and um, a master at operating this business. Uh, so I'll pass it over to Forrest, man. What you got for us, brother? Sure. Thanks, man. Yeah, I'm going through the uh, the notes you had here. Um, as far as the financials, um, when we started, we, you know, we took it over. I think it was at 13,000 for the first month. Um, we're down about 40% over the previous January. So January of 23. And I've noticed that. So I, I acquired another business um, since then. And the same exact thing happened. The first two months take a dip. And then by the third month, the marketing and systems and pipeline and all the stuff that we have uh, is able to jump in and, and get it back up over to where it was. So um, we were down 40% the first month, then we were up you know, slightly. But now um, this past month is, was our highest month so far. We were, uh, I think, 170% over last June, okay. yeah, about 180. So uh, just shy of 3x. We did about 110, 115, um, just depending on which how we put some of the projects in what month, um, because that's always an issue of sometimes it, it goes a little bit longer, but you'll incur expenses for a project in. So for, for instance, we incurred expenses for that in June and we don't get paid until July. So it's like, which one do you put the, the revenue in? If you zoom out to a quarter or to a year, it, it's, it doesn't matter, but just, you know, some of the, those are some of the things here we're looking at for the financials. Um, so, but we did, you know, almost three times what they did last year, um, which is awesome. We've had a, we had a big month. Um, some big projects came in um, July. We're looking to do about similar. We might be slightly down over, you know, say if we did 115, maybe we only do hundred, but we'll see. We still have some time to, to improve that. The lead flow uh, has been really good. Um, so, this time, uh, so as far as net, um, it's anywhere from 10 to 15% currently. Yeah. Um, and that is on the P and L, but that doesn't reflect, um, transfers to the balance sheet. Right. So like if we pay down the seller loan or we're paying off a car loan or uh, like a truck loan, cause we had to buy five trucks so far this year, those aren't reflected in the profitability because that's a, a balance sheet item and not a um, P and L item. So as far as like a cash position, you know, it's pretty break even because we we grew really fast. We've bought five trucks, two trailers, three mowers, uh, and a partridge in a pear tree to get to where we're at. Um, so it's been pretty capital intensive to grow as quickly as we have. And I'm hoping that we can kind of stabilize a little bit here and um, build the cash position up a little bit, especially with some of the um, acquisition opportunities that we're looking at, which we can get into later. Yeah. Um, would you be able to share any screens, uh, like a spreadsheet that, that you ended up sharing with me a little bit, uh, I think a while back and to kind of see the growth of your uh, month over month for this year? Yeah. Let me see if I can get it in here. Cause there's certain things I want yeah, to I keep want... within, right? Sure. For um, like customer information, yeah. but if I What's zoom that? in here, is that good? Yeah, that'll work. Yeah. Um, cause I keep it all in one. Yeah, no worries. Just so uh, the, the audience has like a visual. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. So if you see, like I said, January, we're down. February, we're up slightly, but you know, only by $4,000. And mm -hmm. you can see that we've kind of uh, really increased it in the last couple of months. So yeah. we're 179% of last time. So you can see the run rate for 2023. And then you can also see where we're at for this year. And then I broke it out in quarterly as well. Well, if, if I was a, a person 
on the other side, like the audience, I would ask the, like, there's a huge difference between March and April. Like what mm. made that difference from 14% all the way up to 114%? How, how did we, how do we do that? Yeah. So um, two things really. Number one is just seasonality, right? So when yep. you go into spring, people start thinking about things that they want to do for their, for their yard. And then number two is the marketing systems that we put in place take a little bit of time to get going. So, you know, yeah. we're building this stuff out in, in January and in February, dialing it in in March. And then by the time we hit April, it's, it's cooking. So uh, the other piece is the sales cycle. So that's a huge piece of it actually, is that the work that we did in February and March, uh, you don't even see it on the, the calendar until April. So even if um, we were like getting uh, leads and doing estimates and booking it in the calendar, there's it's like a four to five week, sometimes six week lag time from mm -hmm. when we get the, the, the lead to when the job is done. So it's it just part of it is just timing that it takes a while to actually get these jobs on, on the calendar and, and booked as revenue. Right. Right. And that kind of leads me to kind of in the operations, was it touch on the marketing piece of things? And based on the last six months, if you have an average of how much money we're spending on marketing, including our sales team, including the ads that we're running, do you have an, a ballpark figure like month over month? Yeah. So we actually keep that in a spreadsheet also. Okay. So this awesome. This is for June. Um, you can see what we're spending on Angie's, how much it's generated. Yeah. Um, in each channel, we track how much it generates. Okay. And then you can see at the total, we spent 11,000 in total. And that includes the an appointment setter and a, uh, a marketing assistant. That, so that includes payroll for marketing as well. Okay. Um, which I, I believe is a marketing expense plus ad spend. So uh, projected is like um, for maintenance, you we you know you only realize one month's of revenue when they sign on, but you're assuming that they're going to stay on for for a year is what we do use for our assumption. So we that's what the realized is. But what I think actually matters is our uh, the projected is if them staying on a year realize is what actually matters, right? That's cash today. Mm -hmm. So if we do that, we're just under 10%, which has been my target the whole time for the customer uh, acquisition. So we were baking it in to where we're willing to spend up to 10% for a customer. That's about what it's coming up to. Uh, that's amazing. So the last, the last what, six months now, it's we spent $11,222 and that so was- That's just last month. Oh, that's last month. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, let's see. That's the tab. Okay. So you're like month over month. Okay. So we spent eleven grand and then we got back projected revenue 137,000. Yeah. So of, okay, that's amazing. Yeah. So that includes twenty thousand of projected revenue of assuming that the maintenance customers stay with us for a year. Okay. Which gotcha. is a healthy assumption. That's a that's a pretty healthy healthy return, healthy spread right there. And I mean, how come like other people are not doing this? Cause it seems like, you know, you have a marketing background as far as like other landscapers, right? Other landscaping companies, like if they were to implement this, they could definitely skyrocket their business just as, just like what you're doing for us. It's almost amazing. Yeah. I mean, it would work anywhere. Um, that's something we're looking at doing is, is partnering with people to see if we can do this for them as a service or find a way we can work together with people. So, so tell me a little bit about, about like how that would work out for other landscaping business owners. Yeah, so it's something we're still um, hatching out the, the finer details, but basically we could just do this on a front end for them where all they have to do is basically show up and, and do the job and we'll generate the lead, we'll call the lead, we'll set the appointment. Um, we could even have a, uh, an estimator go out and teach our estimator our sales process so that they close at a higher rate. And then we would either subcontract it out or, or do some kind of a uh, in, uh, partnership with this person. And then they just do the, the actual work. And then we find a way where it makes sense for everybody financially. Oh, wow. That's, that sounds like a, a pretty great business to, to implement for like a mom and pop potentially, or a person that doesn't understand marketing and they can just basically do what they love doing. And then everything else is kind of set for them. Okay. Wow. Exactly. I mean, it takes over the whole front end of the business for them, which is usually yeah. the part that they're not as dialed in because they're they're really good at what they do for the jobs, but this isn't like their forte. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, great. I mean, it sounds like, uh, for, was it just kind of pivoting back to the uh, 
the marketing expense, April and May, were they the same amount of spend to as well? Yeah. So if we go down here to the totals, yeah, you can oh, see what that looks like. So the last three months, we ended up spending roughly about 26K, 27K roughly. The last uh, well, that's, that's revenue. So the total spend is up here. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So this is what we've spent. Um, okay. So $52,000. Is the total okay? Yeah, and so July is preloaded. Certain things we know are fixed costs, we just preload mm -hmm. into it. Um, but certain things like ad spend, we won't know until the end of the month, so those will be added on. This will probably be closer to, to 12 or maybe okay. even 15. Are, are we ramping up the, the marketing as we get closer to the end of the year, or are we going to ramp up for the summer and then kind of like teeter off towards the fall and the winter? What do you think? Um, well, so the, the beautiful thing about down here, and one of the reasons I like the uh, the South for landscaping is that it isn't quite as seasonal as it is um, in Pennsylvania or Virginia or yeah. uh, DC, because um, the ground doesn't freeze down here. So you can do hardscaping projects year round pretty much. And so we want to get our, our marketing ramped up. People aren't thinking about it typically as much in the winter, but we can still do all the work. So if we can get uh, our momentum now and, and find uh, multiple channels that are profitable because we have some channels that are obviously a lot better than others. Like Angie's tends to be our, our best uh, channel currently, but if we can build a few others out so that we can dial it up, uh, it's all about having, you know, control over these things. Like if you, if you know uh, it's an input output where if you know, I put X amount in, I'm going to get X out and we can dial this up and down. Then that's, you know, gives you a control over how many leads you want. Um, yeah. That's what I tell a lot of people who are um, sellers who are like, Oh, and, and, and they're rightly proud, rightly so proud to be like word of mouth only. But mm -hmm. the problem with that is that if we take one of those over, we can't turn that up or down. Like, what yeah. are you going to do? Tell all your customers, hey, please refer me more. Like you're, you're, you know, you're, you're behind, um, you're, you're reactive in your marketing and your leads. You're yeah. waiting for people to give it to you. Whereas this, you, if you want more leads, you just put a little bit more in and you know what your ratio is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. I think. No one I definitely hear that a lot is like a lot of word of mouth and mm -hmm. we've been around the which, business for so long. Yeah, which is great because it means you have a good product. But then if someone's taking that over and they want to buy it, they have no control or ability to increase that. Exactly. A hundred percent. So those are the numbers for marketing and we're kind of touched into a little bit of operations per se. I would like to pivot to like the employees. I mean, last time we spoke, we didn't have a key person in place. Um, have we added a key person in our like the last 30, 90 days to make the business more effective? Yeah, so I recruited a, a good friend of mine who I saw potential in uh, as a leader to be the, um, the manager. He's operations manager. Um, I, I've, when we first started out, I started him out on the, the front lines on the ground level where he's, you know, doing labor and, and mowing and, and doing it right beside the guys. Um, we had the intention of, of getting him to the position he's at now, but we wanted him to earn that spot mm. um, because if he was just placed in that, then people will be like, well, he's, you know, it's nepotism. Or he's just friends with this guy. Like he, that's why he got the position. But mm. um, by doing it the way we did where he earned a spot and I said, for, for us to get you to that position, it should be kind of an obvious choice for the other guys. When they look at you, they're like, well, yeah, it makes sense that he would have that position, like do the job before you have the job kind of thing. And, and he did exactly that. And he was seen as the go-to guy. So it made a very easy transition when he became the, uh, the operations manager, all the guys thought it was an obvious choice and they were you know glad for him. Oh, that's pretty smart. So how long was that person in that role? Uh, was it like a couple of months and then you promoted him or yeah i'd say two three months or so okay um so first he was you know on the front line being uh the upper uh like a laborer basically or like a maintenance guy and then we moved him to like a logistics supervisor where he was still doing some work but he would help coordinate um you know the the equipment or getting some of the supplies and then shortly after we moved him into operations manager where he's directing the crews and he's in charge of even like customer service and making sure people are happy with the job Oh, wow. So that was that, did you explain that whole process to him in the very beginning and then he was able to make a bad transition or was it more of a kind of, I'm going to put you in this role right here real quick. And then a few months later, I'm going to do this. I'm going to tell you to do supervisor role or was it like all just all up front? The goal is to get him to the position he's at now. 
And yeah. so we, we did that and we, we knew what steps to get along there and take your time. And the whole premise was like, you need to earn this. Okay. And he, and he understood that and, and he made good on that. Okay. Well, that's, that's amazing. I didn't know that whole process at all. So did you know about that process, Noble? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually pretty smart uh, because that builds, you know, culture that also builds trust and rapport with the other guys that he's going to be uh, managing and and uh, mentoring potentially. So that, that's actually super smart. And uh, you ended up mentioning stuff about the equipment earlier in the conversation and also about uh, the equipment as of right now. Um I guess kind of refresh uh, my memory and how many trucks do we end up buying? And then how many trucks as far as when we bought the business and then how many trucks do we have today? So when we bought it, we had two, one that didn't run and one that barely ran. Yeah. Um, so we sold back the one that barely ran to the, to the previous owner um, kind of in exchange for one of the seller payments. Um, basically it was almost the same it was like 3,500 versus 4k. Um, mm -hmm. so that kind of wiped out one of the payments, which was nice, but then we had to buy five trucks. Yeah. Um, and when I buy a truck, um, I want it to be low hassle. I don't want to have kind of the, the Damocles sword. If you've ever heard of that, the, the Greek myth where the guy's at the table and he's got a, a sword hanging over his head by a horse hair. And oh. so it's like just a matter yeah. of time before the, the sword falls on his head. And that's how I always feel with like old vehicles and old trucks is that you're just waiting for that mechanic bill, you know, the $3,000, $6,000 transmission bill. So I don't like to do that. So we, I buy um, three years or newer. So like 2020 mm. is the oldest I've gone because it was in, in really good condition, but like 2021 and newer um, with like low miles, like 57 or 50,000 um, or less. Um, and then we get a, a warranty. So like yeah. we know these things are solid. If anything happens, it's covered, but we we know that the trucks are gonna run okay and we're not gonna be taken into the shop all the time because not only do you have to pay for the repairs, but you you lose money from the downtime and the guy's not being on the road. Yeah. So I didn't wanna have to deal with all that stuff. So we bought you know decent trucks, but with that comes a little bit higher price tag, right? We're buying trucks mm -hmm. from anywhere from 30 to 45,000. And when you have to buy five of them, you know, it adds up. Yeah, and how many we like how many trucks we buy in like the span of what basically three months? So we bought all all these trucks, all five, all five trucks in the last three months. Okay, so that basically puts it at a hundred and hundred and what fifty trucks, hundred fifty k, and just and just for equipment, just alone. Yeah, roughly. Yeah, yeah roughly. I'd say because we put money down on each of them, um, which also is you know a drag on the the cash position, but um, yeah. you know they're. We do that after making a calculation of whether it's worth spending this money. So we know that it, even with the interest and and all that, it's still going to be you know profitable to make that trade. Yeah, because we are looking at our cash flow for our future projections, and that will be able to cover the expense associated with the equipment that we end up buying, which is the new trucks. Uh, mm -hmm. But you also end up mentioning we bought new new mowers. How many mowers did we end up starting with when we first bought the business, and where are we at now? We started with. Three or four. I mean, it depends oh. if you're talking about like a, a walk behind or a zero turn versus a oh, push mower. Right. We had a bunch of push mowers. Right. Um, but like it was started with like three or so. Um, one of them we've already had to get rid of. Another one's in the shop right now. And then one of them's still running, but we had to buy two or three more. I feel okay. exactly. I, I want to say it's at least two, maybe three. And each mower is what, like a couple thousand bucks? Yeah, like six. Six thousand bucks seven. per buck. Yeah, and they're not like the push mowers, they're actually the, the ride mowers where you just do zero turns and all that stuff. Yeah, or the walk behind where you're like standing on the thing behind it. Oh, right, right. Okay. So we bought two or two or three of those, and then do we buy anything else as far as we bought some trailers too, right? Yeah. Uh two trailers, a uh an enclosed trailer and a dump trailer. And those were like how much? Six or seven for the enclosed. I uh -huh. think seven for the enclosed and ten for the dump trailer. Okay. That's like a thing that like a dump truck goes back. Oh man, we spent like probably close to, it sounds like we probably spent close to $250,000 all in all in the last six months of just buying equipment. Yep. Okay. That, that's a good amount. And the business is yeah. able to basically afford that per se, because we're just mm -hmm. doing of, of, of marketing and payment. Okay. Right. Um, I mean, it, all the learning lessons that you end up having in the last three months, like what would you say if a person was going to buy this kind of business again, like what would you tell them to be aware of? Um, just watch your cash position. Um, it's probably the, the biggest thing. That's the number one reason that businesses fail is, is that cash position. So as we're buying these things, you know, you got to make sure you have profit to do it, but then that 
kind of pulls into your profit, right? That you're reinvesting it back into the business. So just keep a, an eye on that cash that you have enough to cover. Right. And then did you end up allocating a particular budget per month to uh, for equipment or was it more like an ad hoc situation when you needed it? As needed. Yeah, as needed. If we saw we had enough work to warrant another crew, we would buy the truck um, and get that going for them. Okay. Yeah, the so other thing like I would say actually um, was a huge learning lesson was cash cycle conversion. Yeah. So when you basically like how long it takes you to get paid yep. and how it is... Um, the relationship of that and your costs going out, right? Because if you're not taking a deposit, then you're paying for the labor and the materials and everything you're fronting before you get paid. Yeah. With, with If you mix that with all this equipment, it makes it really tough to keep a position of cash to be able to keep the business running. And so um, what we started doing is taking deposits, which is standard, but that's just a lesson we learned, you know, uh, the hard way versus actually just, you know, knowing that going into it. But we take a, a deposit now um, to, in order to get them on the schedule, and that helps alleviate that. It basically covers us to pay for the um, materials and a little bit of the labor so that when we go and collect, that's when we actually make some money. I see. Okay. And so that's was... all out of pocket. Yeah. I mean, jumping into that particular cash cycle conversion, I mean, that's like a system that we were actively planning and seeing how we could come up with a solution. And so like in the last, I guess, 90 days or so, what kind of new systems have we implemented uh, to help mitigate some of the the issues or inefficiencies in the business itself? Uh, well, the, the deposit was huge yeah. um, to, to do, to taking those that helps a lot with the cash flow. The other one is we use a software now um, for like dispatch and scheduling and invoicing. We use uh, Jobber as a software, um, which has been really good. We can put all the uh, maintenance visits on a, a day and it'll automatically route them the most efficiently way, efficient way. It'll let people know we're coming. It keeps track of all the visits because the way we had it before was slightly, uh, but when we inherited, it was completely manual. It was like on paper. Um, and then we cr created a new way that was like slightly better, but not quite fully automated. And now we have a way where it's fully automated. Like every time the job gets marked off, it gets logged and then it goes onto the invoice automatically. Because before we were having to go and transfer them over to the invoices and, mm -hmm. you know, became a two hour, three hour process every month. for billing. Right. Yeah, it was a, it was a pain in the ass and, what I heard from from you in our conversations and our in our high level meetings that was like that was like the bottleneck uh, for a little bit, um, but I want to kind of pivot here a little quick uh, to to Noble in regards to the M and A side of things and how we are looking to find other companies and basically what our struggles and what our journey has been. So, um, do you Noble like what kind of marketing channels have we implemented this this quarter versus last quarter? Yeah, so we have we have done some Facebook marketing and also we've added direct mail as well as email campaign. We're continuing cold calling. And yeah, so those are some of the different campaigns that we're continuing on uh, in terms of the, keeping our pipeline robust and mm -hmm. really targeting these companies multiple different ways because we're very, very... And we can talk about this, but we're very, very uh, targeted in what we're looking for. And everything has to be in a certain, like a close radius from where we are. So we really have to be extremely pinpoint targeted when it comes to the acquisition side, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Uh, I, I will, I will kind of dig in deep here in regards to direct mail, because that is a point where, you know, it's, it's a learning lesson. It's a, also a failure, but also a learning lesson. Um, can you kind of go over like what we end up spending and kind of the results we end up getting with direct mailing? Well, the thing is, is that we didn't have a large sample size of um, leads that we can, you know, target. So I think we had about 70 or 80 um, leads that we actually were going after, but we didn't, we didn't actually get any, anything back. We've spent about $250. It was a test. So, mm -hmm. We're just testing different things out. So I think it was, I wouldn't call it a total failure because right. then at the same time, we, you know, we can hit the list again and hit it multiple times at some point. The, the key with that is to be consistent and to keep going. So 
that's something with all of our channels is that to keep what we're doing and 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 be consistent. And the most important thing is with everything we're doing is and we'll talk about this later too, but following up is is yep. mainly the best marketing. Yeah. And and I think you can probably speak more to this, Noble. Like what what has been our best out of all the channels we'll be marketing, well, what, what's the best one that you feel like has been the best ROI return, you know? Well, the free one. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's the free one? The free one is the uh the cold calling. The yeah. cold calling. We've had a lot of success on the cold calling side of the business. And I think that that is something because it's maybe personal reaching out to these folks. But I think with cold calling is more about following up. So I think we're really good at that, at following up mm -hmm. because you can talk to someone who's not quite interested in January, but if you can continue to follow up with them, they may be interested in July. So I think that's been one of the reasons why we are getting, you know, these leads that are are opportunities that are coming around right now. And we're starting to see more of that through the cold calling side that we started six, seven months ago. So following I up. I can confirm really that. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, some of uh, the guys that I've talked to that you set up have, have multiple of them have mentioned that you followed up with them and eventually they had time to do it or they were just like, oh, this guy must be serious because he's followed up. Yeah. Right. They mentioned that as one of the reasons they, they reached out. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, follow-up is key in, in, in any business, even in the in our landscaping business, right? We have a lead that comes in, we got to follow up with them continuously until we get the sell or they tell us to F off. Like one of the two, like right. we, we want an answer. <laughs> yeah, we, we call them like 10 times. Yeah, exactly. Or text, like call or text, like uh, 10 touches before we give up on a lead. And that's and that's your metrics, right? For the salesperson? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the for the setter. Yeah, that's part of what they, they need to do is 10 touches before the market is abandoned. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, because of, you know, Noble and, you know, myself doing follow-up, we've been able to present, you know, opportunities for, to, to give the forest to kind of see if it might be a good fit for the actual acquisition of and growing the business itself. We have one right now that we're talking to that's a little bit smaller than us, but not by much. And then we have a company that we're talking to that are like 6X bigger than us that we would love to buy. Um, and having, I mean, can you, I guess, elaborate as far as like the, the benefits of having an m and &A, a team, uh, to work while you're working on the business forest? Yeah. I mean, it'd be pretty tough for me to do what you guys are doing plus what I'm doing. Yeah. So, and, you know, like I wouldn't be able to dedicate the time you guys are doing to doing that. So it's nice to kind of have that piece taken care of, uh, almost like outsourced yeah. where I just, I just show up when, it, when it's ready for me to chat with them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, a lot, it's actually pretty fun for us too, as well, to present these opportunities to, to you for us to like say, Hey, I think this might be a good business for us to merge with or just acquire to be able to grow the business exponentially. And I mean, since you're the, the driver of the business, like, can you kind of speak about your vision and what you want to do in the next five to seven years, just to get uh, like the audience, um, you know, just in, in information about what you want to do? I mean, the goal is to, to build this up um, into, into a roll-up long-term. Um, I say five to seven, but it's probably more like seven to 10 if we really think about what the time it takes to do some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we're on a great great trajectory now, but um, you just say within the next 10 years, we want to build this up, um, find some um, business owners who are ready to retire, give them a good deal where they can still get some some income and, and, and profit from the hard work they've done. And then we can take that and just by the function of being larger, get a, a higher multiple um, and build a really solid company that's good at what they do. Because uh, at the end of the day, if you just roll them up and you're just trying to to make money and the, and the uh, service suffers, you're not really going to have that great of a business. So we want to create something that's really solid, but also has potential for some some upside um, yeah. with exit events for us. Right, exactly. Uh, which is super exciting for us. And we are talking to brokers too as well um, for other marketing channels for M&A. Um, and so that's been a really good piece with some of the deals that we've been looking at. And there's a lot of other deals that have kind of fall through with the brokers and they kind of circle back to us and seeing if we're interested, which is obviously we are interested. Um, but I don't have anything else as far as what's on the agenda today. I want to give you guys some space to have some closing thoughts 
for this six month mark and what you guys are maybe looking forward to, uh, learning lessons, takeaways, anything of that nature, or um, your last, your thoughts. So yeah, I'll pass so, over to Noble, yeah. Yeah, so on the M&A side, we, we understand it's a process, right? And we are refining our approach and tightening up our criteria as we move forward. And really going after the larger size, what we've learned is that we should go after larger size companies that have strong synergies, as well as verticals that we can tap into so we can have a more diverse portfolio as we move forward going into this roll-up. Uh, and also, we have den identified companies that fit that criteria. So as we move forward, just getting really more more targeted in what we're trying to do and just focusing on, on growing the company through acquisition as well, because Forrest has done such an amazing job. Uh, I also should mention, because Forrest has done such an amazing job, we have to evaluate the real estate. But when we're, when we're looking at these deals, we have to see how we can integrate what we're currently doing into the next deal that we're, we're getting ready to potentially get into. So we are looking to see how we can expand and and grow in the future. So those have been some key insights for us as we move forward in our journey. Yeah, awesome. How about you, Forrest? Yeah, I mean, I'd say for someone who's looking to do, you know, something similar to, you know, be ready for the ups and the downs. I mean, you got to kind of surf the the waves um, if you're going to be in the operations side. I mean, uh, um, the, the group that we come from, Protégé, you know, they're really good and focused on the acquisition stage. Um, but just like we were talking about last night, that's kind of like the the trip to the marathon starting line, mm -hmm. right? So if you're going to go run a marathon, you got to get a hotel and, and fly to whatever city and then drive up to the starting line and then the real race begins. Um, so that's, you know, I'd say prepare for that going through, you know, good operating principles, um, really solid horizontal skills that you could use for anything. But I would say that's where uh, the make or break is, is on that operation side. So, you know, you just got to take the, the ups and the downs as they come. Yeah. And find good people. You know, like I wouldn't <laughs> be able to do any of this without us finding good people like like you guys, for instance, or Justin, be able to manage the team mm -hmm. or having uh, a high bar for our employees. Like we have some really solid guys. We we tend to pay a slightly more than than average, but we expect more. And um, part of our culture there, uh, one of our core values is winners only. And we, we talk about how it's a small company, so we have no space for anything but A players. Yeah. Um, so just kind of building that and making sure you have good people, I'd say is really key. Yeah, that's, that's a really good takeaway. And and I definitely appreciate you guys so much for jumping on and like providing value as always for the, like the last six months we've been operating this business. Um, I have nothing but appreciation for you guys and also for the audience that's listening. Hope you guys got value from our conversation of our small little landscaping company out of Buford, Georgia. We're always looking to grow and buy more businesses in that area in the landscaping space. If you guys happen to have any of those, Feel free to reach out to any of us. I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace, guys.